Once upon a time, keyboards were massive, with all the keys and functions you would wish for at the touch of a finger. But for the past years, everyone has tried to shrink down on their keyboards. But that has left us without access to some of our best companions, the arrow keys. But fortunately, this era ends today with the rise of the Geek GK64 60% mechanical keyboard. A tool that's as compact as it gets, but that will help us gain back our dear, dedicated arrow keys. So, as you probably guessed, we'll take a look at this GK64 board today. And not only does it have dedicated arrow keys in the same form factor than other 60% boards, it also has hot swappable Gateron switches, brown in my case, and it's also RGB backlit, and it has a USB Type-C port like the great Ann Pro 2 and the Ducky 1-2 Mini. And right now, you can get this keyboard for 65 US dollars. Is this the best bang for your buck if you're transitioning from a full-size keyboard? Honestly, I think so, but I'll show you why in the following. The keyboard comes in a brown box, and mine is kind of torn apart because this fluffy boy thought it was the best bed ever. Oh well. But normally you would get the keyboard itself, as well as a braided USB Type-C cable, a keycap puller, and a switch puller. And I would however recommend getting a wire keycap puller as plastic ones, like the one they included, don't attach easily to your keycaps and they're a bit too bulky in most areas. I also fear it might scratch the included ABS keycap, so keep that in mind. The keyboard is lightweight, definitely lighter than an N Pro 2 or a Poker 2. And the case it comes with is alright, but the plastic doesn't feel as great as the keyboards I just mentioned. At the back there's the USB Type-C port, it feels super solid and it doesn't wiggle, I like that. At the bottom you get 4 rubber feet, but there's no angle adjustment like you would find on the Ducky 1-2 Mini. As mentioned earlier, this unit has dedicated arrow keys in the same form factor than a regular 60% keyboard without losing too many of the other keys. They achieved that by making some of the keys narrower, like both of the shift keys, then the right part of the bottom row has one unit keys instead of the standard 1.25, so they can fit an extra key there. And the right shift key is also a one unit key to leave room for the arrow up key and a delete key. The rest of the layout does match the NC standard layout though. The setup is a bit unconventional, but I've seen other 64 key keyboards having the same layout. And there are a few third party keycap options available, one of which I have right here with me and I'll install it later in this video to give you an idea. Another easy option would be to go with a full size keycap set that has the same profile across the rows, like DSA or XDA, and you would be able to reuse some of the additional keys from the numpad to fill the unconventional spots. Now, one of the main selling points of this board would be the hot swappable switches. It comes preloaded with Gateron switches, either in the blue, red, or brown variants, which I think is pretty good for the price you pay. Gaterons are regarded as great value switches by most people, I'd say, and I do like these browns. But if you ever get tired of these, you can remove the keycaps and then with the included middle switch removing tool, swap out the switches for anything else that you want. The switches also stick to the keycaps sometimes, but it's pretty easy to install them back. The LEDs are soldered on the PCB, so you don't really need to worry about that, as long as your switches housings are transparent, or at least leave an empty space where the LED shines. I think that's a really neat feature, and it gives a lot more flexibility than traditional boards, and I only have Gateron brown switches on hand, so that makes this demo not that exciting, but I bet these milky housings will be much better. It should fit any switch that has the standard Cherry MX pin layout and shape, and it should also fit 5 pin switches as it has holes where the plastic pins would go, and I tried both and it wasn't hard to remove them and install them either way. With the included tool, it's super easy to do and it's a lot less risky than desoldering a whole PCB. While this keyboard has more keys than a typical 60% keyboard, it also lacks a lot of them, like function 1 to function 12, the numpad and the control keys like home, page down, etc. 
to access them, there has to be a layer system and this keyboard has one built in with up to three additional layers that you can program and assign, as well as a built in one that cannot be changed from what I understand, which is represented by the printed legends at the bottom of the keys. All of that and other settings can be changed using the keyboard software, which you can download on the products page via a Google Drive link. Now, this software is quite complex, I'd say, not that easy to use, but it allows for so much customization, more than pretty much any keyboard I've seen yet. There are up to four profiles on this keyboard, three that are stored on board and one that is entirely dependent on the driver. I actually don't know why they made the one that's not stored on board. I don't see why it would be preferable. I think you can add additional shortcuts to open programs in the driver mode, but I wouldn't be sure. But for every profile, you can change all the keys functionalities on the base layer and the three additional ones. And for every layer, you can also change the RGB illumination. You can either have animations or key by key colors, and you can even have animations triggered when you hold down the key, or you can even create your own animations, which I haven't gotten very deep in, as there are plenty of built-in ones that you can customize, and there are really a lot of built-in animations that I have never seen before, actually, with some that are pretty awesome, and I thought that was pretty cool. You also get animations that are triggered by ambient sound as there is a microphone in the keyboard and you also get some that are triggered by the output volume of your computer. This is some pretty impressive stuff. There is also an all white theme which is really white and that's quite surprising as RGB LEDs often have a tin but this one is pretty good actually. So overall the lighting quality is great and the built-in animations are really outstanding. You can also switch between a few on board with the built-in function layer, as well as adjust the brightness and speed, which is pretty cool if you're on the go, but it only works when you're not set to a specific profile. With advanced features like that, you really need a good UI with clear indications on how to do stuff, which isn't exactly the case, so it does take a bit of time to understand how it works, but it does give you a lot of customization when you learn how to use it. And finally, you would also be able to record macros, which is really easy. You just record one and you can assign it to a key on the base layer or on the additional layers. Speaking of additional layers, you can access them with the function buttons, which are not assigned by default. And I assign function to to the delete key. And I also assign the right control key to a right alt key instead, as I use that modifier a lot but the default keycaps don't have an additional alt key, so this is where a third-party keycap set comes in. This PBT keycap set retails for $30 US, but there's actually a rebate going on when you buy both the GK64 and this set, so that would bring it down to an additional 24 bucks instead. And I really like this team, and it would go nicely with a wooden case. The keycaps are super thick, and the legends are die sublimated, which is really durable. So really great quality keycaps for the price. I also like the font, it's simple and it looks nice. The keycaps that come with a keyboard are nothing to be excited about. They're ABS and they're a laser edge, so they will shine over time and the black die will probably wear off someday as well. It's not the end of the world as that's what most keyboards from big brands like Corsair and Razer come with, but it's nice to know that you can replace them at a reasonable cost. As for these third-party keycaps, they're a perfect fit for the GK64 and they also come with additional shift keys to accommodate slightly different layouts. And one last thing I haven't talked about yet are the stabilizers and to my surprise, they're pretty good. In fact, they already had lubricant applied. I really didn't expect that and that's the first time I see lube pre-applied on the keyboard. I think it really shows that they know a thing or two and they're not putting up keyboard parts together without knowing about the details. The only thing is that they stick a lot in the keys so you'll need to be gentle to make sure you don't break anything. These also sit on what seems like an aluminum plate and it feels solid. Now I'll leave you to a sound test so you make up your mind.
And that leads us to the pros and cons, starting with the negative aspects. The software isn't super user friendly. There's a lot of settings, so it can be a bit hard to understand at first, compared against the Anpro 2 software as an example. Although it has dedicated arrow keys, the layout still requires some time to get used to, especially the right shift key, which is a lot narrower. So don't expect this to be like switching to a 10 keyless keyboard. It will take a bit of time to regain your usual typing speed. Also, the layout doesn't completely meet the ANSI standard, which limits the keycap selection. Speaking of keycaps, they are ABS and the texture is not that great. They will shine easily, but it's what you would expect from most keyboards and they can be replaced easily if you want. Finally, it's not compatible with third-party cases. The screw layout is not standard, so apart from the keycaps and switches, it will probably stay as is unless you go the DIY route. Now that's out of the way, I really like the fact that it has a USB Type-C port and the included cable is braided. The hot swappable switches are a nice feature and it adds a lot of flexibility to the board, giving you the chance to try out different switches without buying a new keyboard every time, or maybe even have a variety of switches across the board. I also like that it comes with Gaterons by default, so although you can replace them, they're still great switches to start with, or simply if you don't plan on replacing them. I also like the fact that you get dedicated arrow keys while still keeping the 60% form factor. The keyboard doesn't add any bulk, but you get more keys, some of which might help a few to transition to a 60% board. And finally, the RGB animations, while not necessarily easy to create on your own, are really impressive. You can pretty much do what you want in terms of RGB lighting with this keyboard if you dedicate the time, and I really like that. So should you get this instead of a regular 60% mechanical keyboard like the Ant Pro 2 or Ducky 1-2 Mini? The biggest difference is the layout for me and the hot swappable switches. Both the Ant Pro 2 and Ducky 1-2 Mini don't have dedicated arrow keys and their switches are soldered in so that could be a deciding factor. Otherwise the Ant Pro and Ducky have superior keycaps out of the box. The Ducky has Cherry MX switches, while the Anpro comes with either Gaterons or Kalebox switches. And I think there's a version with Cherry MX switches now, so it's mostly personal preference at this point. All three of these boards have decent stabilizers, and all three have extensive RGB control, this GK64 being the most customizable, and the Ducky being the least. So I think this makes a solid option if you're on a budget or simply if the lack of arrow keys is a big downside or maybe you just want the hot swappable switches. One other important factor would be that the Anpro supports Bluetooth connectivity while this board doesn't and that would be the last important difference I think. So to wrap this up, this keyboard gets a big yes from me. The overall quality and feature set are simply amazing for the asking $65 price making this a killer value as long as you want this specific layout. Now for me, I think I'll stick to the Anpro just because I'm used to the normal 60% layout and I have more boards with that layout than the 64 key GK64, so it's simply more practical for me. But otherwise, I wouldn't mind switching to it as my main board. And as always, I'll have a link down below if you want to check it out for yourself. So thank you for watching, make sure you liked the video if you did, and if you didn't, just let me know why in the comments below. Otherwise, don't forget to subscribe if you still haven't already, as I'll see you in the next video.